Uh, well, a fabulous film. Thank you. A uh, lot to talk about, obviously, but um, uh, it sort of it struck me that there was uh, it was a jazz storytelling in a lot of ways because it jumped all over the place. A uh, little bit hard to follow in some places. I take that as a compliment. I'm not sure if the audience absolutely, does. Absolutely, absolutely a compliment. Total, total jazz piece with the different uh, voices that you had, uh, you know, adding to the story, uh, adding to the piece of music that it was uh, in the storytelling. So really fascinating way that it was put together. Can you just tell us uh, what put you on to Omar and, and making this film? Your, yeah, your yeah. film teacher. Absolutely, yeah. And then is other films before this one? Yeah, um, I, I made a film about my father um, called My Father's Vietnam, and, and it came out in 2016. Um, much different kind of film um, about my dad serving in Vietnam and, and two guys that he knew who were killed there and their families and their experiences and the way they intersected and the way they diverged. Um, but, it, you know, similarly to this one, took me nearly 10 years to put together. I mean, I, I don't... I don't know that I'll ever know what I'm doing. Like this is, I, I, this is very, and I mean this very honestly. Like some people are sort of fishing for compliments. Like this is not. Um, a th I think I feel probably more at home teaching now than I do as, as a filmmaker. Um, but I, I uh, yeah, Omar, Omar, um, I, I was writing for a, a, a short-lived, now defunct, um, arts and culture magazine based in Providence called Tribe. Um, don't look for it; you can't find it. Um, but the lovely editor in chief, um, Tony Aguilar. Um, gave me a stack of CDs like this tall um, that you could colloquially refer to as world music. I don't really like the that name very much, but I but you know what I mean, uh, international music, um, and lots of big names and names you've heard of and and um, household names and um, and one of them was Omar Sosa, who who like many of you I expect I, I hadn't heard of before, um, and this was 2010 or 11. Um, and I was sort of struggling and figuring out, trying to, you know, how to turn my own curiosity about different subjects into a focused career, which is a word I, I never used until very recently. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, thank you, Clark University, for that. Um, but but I, I uh, so I, I was able to get in touch with his manager quite easily. If you just go on the back of one of Omar's CDs, it's like Ota Records, and there's an address and a P.O. box and maybe even a phone number on some of them, and you just call up, and there's an office number. And I got Scott Price, uh, who, you, who you met in the film, Omar's manager, and, and he said, sure, you, know, you want to Skype? Skype is uh, something we had before Zoom. I don't know if anybody <laughs> still <laughs> remembers Skype. And it's very strange. Whatever before happened? FaceTime, What too. happened to Skype? Right, exactly, yeah. Um, all of a sudden, Zoom had all the market share, and it's like, what? what? I was Skyping before. Everything was fine. Uh, so, so we Skyped for um, you know, like an hour. You know, he didn't have to give me any of his time. He could have just been like, who are you, and what is this publication? And instead, his manager said, yeah, well, how about this night or that night? Or, and Omar and I we went back and forth, and we just... And we had a nice chat, and I recorded the chat, and it ended up not even being much of a story. I would just transcribe the interview, and I'm not a fast typist, um, nor a fast filmmaker. Uh, and I pecked it out, and it was, yeah, this hour-long conversation, and it turned out that though he's 10 years older than I am, and I grew up in central Connecticut, and he grew up in Camagoy, Cuba, that we had a lot in common um, in terms of musical influences and... and um, you know, different things that, that we, that spoke to us about fusion or jazz or whatever, but he, he really is just like kind of post genre or he's a pluralist in, in his activities. He, he, he enjoys everything. And I try to, I try to do the same thing. So I, so I just said, you know, sorry, this is a long story. Um, I, uh, I said, you know, do, would you mind if I filmed, uh, you and Paolo Frezu, um, who's the Italian trumpeter who holds that long, he does that long, um, uh, I, I, I wasn't watching the film, um, I have to admit, and I, I sort of sneaked up here because everyone always claps in the audience in the, in the screenings and people did here, which I was so, I almost said jazzed, which is too, too on the nose. Um, but I, I, I'm so gra grateful for people clapping in a movie theater or a theater situation, a film festival situation during the film. That's such a cool thing. Um, but yeah, so that was the first time I filmed him. It was 2013 in South Orange Performing Arts Center in New Jersey, of all places. Um, my friend lives like less than a mile from there now, which is really funny. Um, but yeah, it was this magical kind of concert and I had a great lunch with him and we just kind of connected enough that every time he came back, I was kind of waiting for a comment. I, I knew I didn't have the money or the time to follow him around on a tour. So I just waited and, and then it turned out every year he came back, he was in a different 
group. He had a quartet or a quintet or a duo or a trio, and I was just like, oh, this is cool. And then, then I started collecting. You know, his manager started sending me all the archival material that he could possibly send me in. So, sorry, this is the longest answer in history to one no, question. No, 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 it's, it's, a, it's <laughs> exactly right. It's exactly right. And it's, it's exactly what we wanted to know, and you, and you told us the whole story, so that's great. And I think that you do have a lot in common in terms of the way that you made the film and, and approached him, and he obviously, throughout the filming, you see that he's open to everything. And he's open to all these collaborations. Mm. He's open to, you know, this. he hears this, he wants to learn from that. He has influences that he gets to catch up with later on. And you have musical influences, but you're like open to whatever. And the two of you obviously hit it off that way. But he seems to hit it off that way with everyone. Yes. Um, everyone that he cares yeah, about. I, I don't. That but. shares the spirit and so <laughs> forth. Uh, I think you're lying. At any rate. He, he um, definitely does. So uh, I was going to say about that, um, the first musical piece, yes, pluralist, and the first piece that, that is played in the film uh, made me think of Keith Jarrett right away, mm. which, uh, which, which it doesn't go on to. I'll tell him you way. said that. He'll be very gratified. <laughs> <laughs> well, but it's not, his, it's not, it's obviously his own music. Yeah. Later on, you get into all the Afro-Cuban different things that he does and all the electro things, but that, that element of, of creativity was just, it was remarkable and, and a great entryway into the film. Mm. But I want to talk about, uh, first of all, Let's, let's just deal with the Alegua in the room. Mm -hmm. Where did that story come in from? Where did you, how did you decide to weave that through? And what, what, was, that, what was that all about, the Alegua? Sure, um, I, I do really quickly, I, I, about the Keith Jarrett thing, I had asked him, this is like a stock question. I, I love your question about Alegua and we'll get right into that, but um, th there's this stock question that you ask musicians if you're interviewing them, which is like, what are your influences? You know, it's like this kind of fast, it's like, of course, like that's the where you start, like where did you get into this? It's an origin question. Like you asked me, where did the film start? So where did, the, where did you start with this? And then he would, he would talk about Oscar Peterson and he would talk about Andrew Hill and he would talk about um, these he, uh, Randy Weston, who was still with us at that time, and all these different amazing jazz pianists, and then all you know, all this kind of Cuban stuff and world stuff, and all this you know different kinds of things. Um, and I, I remember at one point I said, "What about Keith and Herbie and Chick? Like I, those are the people I wanted to talk about." I was like, "Keith Jarrett, Herbie Hancock, you know, Chick Corea." Um, and he really. He was like, well, those guys are still kind of doing their thing <laughs> at this point when I started interviewing him. So I was like, I don't like to talk about them as influences because it makes it sound like their careers are over. And he's like, I don't really touch that. But he's like, of course, that's like this holy trinity, I think, to a lot of people, which is Keith Jarrett and, and Herbie Hancock and Chick Corea. What's that? McCoy and McCoy, McCoy, McCoy too. McCoy I, I love yeah. McCoy, but yeah, I, I think I, more for Omar. I, I, I don't know why I mentioned those three guys, but that, that's true. Yeah, McCoy for sure. Yeah. Um, anyway, so the Elegua um, stuff, it was very early that, like the first interview that I did with him, um, that you that you hear while while you hear that piece, "Sunrise" from his record "Calma." Um, he, uh, he, I, I, the first one of the first questions I asked him was like, "Tell me about this ritual that you do. You always have a candle. You always have this this red piece of fabric with you." Or you know, I didn't even call it a scarf. I don't think at the time, but I was like, "What is this piece of fabric? And what is the elegua? Like, what does this statue mean? And all this kind of stuff." Um, and it, it, it's it, being a, being in a, from a from a secular congregational family again in Central Connecticut where I, I was never baptized right so it's like I don't have a, a level of spirituality or a level of religion that this person has um, but I wanted to know about his and I was totally open to hearing about his as you said talking about being open about things um, and he he sort of laid it out for me that this was like a thing that that put him in touch with whatever whatever um, continuum that he's on, um, trajectory that he's on with ancestry. Um, and I think, and, and that's another word that I stopped on, and that's when we got on that conversation about, about Miles Davis, about ancestors. And he was like, well, no, ancestors isn't like ancient. It, it, ancestry isn't, isn't your, your family five million years ago. It, the, the, he's like, no, ancestry is like, it, it's, it's like you have this connection to people in the past that did things that allow you to do the things that you do, um, and and this kind of unspoken connection that you have, and he and he in fact included me in that. He 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 was much, he was much more kind of like on this, um, you know, time going forwards, going backwards, and and kind of thing, and, and said you know you you feel it when you connect with people, when you when you connect with an audience, when you connect with a a person that you just met for the first time, you're able to have this con kind of e easy conversation, and he laid it out in this way that wasn't like. 
that kind of like would, would like alienate a lot of people. Where it's like, oh, tell me about this this crystal thing that you're into or this aromatherapy, and 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 then you they they lose you a little bit. And and again, nothing against anybody in the room. I just sometimes sometimes people explain their spirituality or their religion, and and it, you they lose you, especially if you're a secular guy like me. Um, and and I was just kind of like, okay, okay, so tell me about Elegua, tell me about this. So he so he went into it for me without saying, well, no, you wouldn't understand mm -hmm. um, because I'm this and I'm a Santero or I grew up in, in this area and you wouldn't understand because X, Y, Z or you don't speak Spanish or you, you know, when, when you get into, into, into a conversation with somebody that's it's really super into a religion, they might say, um, any religion, I, I, but they might say, you don't, you don't speak the language, you're not a scholar and therefore you're, you're not allowed connection to this, the door is closed to you and for him, it's all about this kind of like give and take, uh, open and closed doors, light and darkness. Like everybody has it, and everybody can talk about it. So it was. It just. It, I, I sort of immediately knew this was important to him. But to tell you the truth, dividing the film up into that Elegua uh, story was one of the last things that I did. Um, so I, I I knew that I had I, there were some issues with the film, and and I needed to. There are so many different kinds of footage and different configurations of the bands that it's like I didn't want people to get hung up on like, well, what year is this? And what time did that happen? And what, you know? So I wanted to go back to the chrono chronological telling of the Elegua story in, in order for everybody to be like, okay, like exhale, we're gonna get a couple seconds where there's this story going on and then we're gonna go back to Omar and it's like, who cares? Like, let it be chaotic, let it be improvised and let you not really know kind of where it's going. So, but that was a, that was a, very, a very simple um, narrative uh, a gesture that I, I just opened up a CD and I and that's listed. I mean, it's, <laughs> the story it's a translation. Is there. <laughs> it's just right there, and I, I lifted it almost verbatim. Yeah, and you know, with with permission, of course. <laughs> but it was just like this is a good way to divide the story. It, it worked really well, and it, again, if you think of the film as a sort of a jazz piece of its own, that's a theme that runs through it to bring it back to whatever it is, and then improvise off of that. So Absol it absolutely works yeah. really well. Yeah. Let's talk a, bit, a, a minute about uh, putting the animation in. Uh, who did your animation? How did you weave that in? I, I love the fact that the candle was behind all the city names and dates. Yeah. You had the candle th as Thanks. a through line for the animation. <laughs> but the animation for Angola, and then there's later on for San Francisco, other places, there's the animation. Yeah. Um, one, of the, one of the frustrating things and then kind of just education things that, that happened for me or informative things that happened for me um, where you sort of recognize your own biases, or you're just like, well, send me, send me the pictures from your yearbook. And it's like, what? Like, no. <laughs> it's, it's like, where are all the pictures of you in high school? And where are all the, you know, so it's, it's slightly, like, oh, we, there must be at least 10 pictures of you serving in Angola. Like, no, what? No. <laughs> so I, so there, I knew that there were these episodes from his life, especially his early life and early adult life, um, that there were no, there was no documentation. I, I was lucky for the, the Ziomara Logar, uh, footage that I that I had um, from Cuba, the sound is destroyed on it. It, it doesn't. It, it I can't even. You wouldn't even want to listen to it. So, just the cutaways that I had of of him playing on Cuban television with Yomara was such a gift. But I knew that there were these these problems of like, okay, Angola, and then when he's um, briefly kind of like without a place to stay in, in Havana, and um, you know, and going to Ecuador and doing these doing these jingles like there, there's not nobody's there with a phone or like with a you know camera documenting the whole thing, um, and so I knew animation was something I wanted to do from the very beginning. Um, animations, if if any if anybody's ever made a film before, that you know, animation's really expensive and really time consuming. Um, and so when I raised what the twenty thousand dollars that I raised through Kickstarter, um, it was soon very clear that like 15,000 of it would end up going to animation when I thought maybe five would. Um, I was like, oh, I could probably, you know, so it was very naive and, um, but yeah, it was Floating Pear, um, based in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, which is, I, I live in Cranston, Rhode Island. I wanted to get a local uh, company to do it um, so I could at least have meetings with them and bring them baked goods and bribe them in whatever way I could. <laughs> um, they, they're probably not my biggest fans at this point. Um, but I also wanted um, a, a company that was owned by people of color, which was important to me, and that, and that's a that's a company that's that's run, you know, owned by 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 two uh, BIPOC individuals. The reason for that isn't like that I'm so politically correct or PC, um, or or woke or whatever. It's it's more that I didn't want white artists, white animators drawing Omar's figure, like drawing Omar's skin color, drawing Omar in these in these locations. So. 
that was important. That was super important to me. Like I, I, I remember that being kind of like, okay, how, how I need to do this. And I just got lucky that not only were, was this a BIPOC owned company, but also that they were lo they were located in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, which is like a 10 minute drive from my house. So I could like go there, bribe them and ply them with baked goods um, and try to be their best friend. Um, and they, and they produced amazing work. And so that's been really, that was, I was, it was a difficult process. Cause I, like I said, I'm, and this is a, that, that was the first time I had ever worked with an animator before. The next time I do, I'll, I'll raise like a million dollars instead and, and kind of just make the whole thing animated. But yeah, yeah they were well, great. You did have a long list of thank yous. Um, yeah. So, and which is, which is, which is right. It's, it's getting longer. So. And well, it takes, it takes a long time to do it. Do you have a card? I'm going to put you on. <laughs> um, so then uh, I think you could have made a film just about how many different glasses frames he has. Yeah, well, he's like the Elton John of Afro-Cuban music, I, I would say. And, and like Elton John's supposedly retiring, although he's taking like five or six years to do it. So I think once Elton retires, like maybe Omar could be known as the guy with the sort of glasses collection, like, a, you know, that was the remarkable. new piano man or something. I was trying to figure out in different parts of it by, by identifying what area of his life this was from by the glasses frames, but it's, yeah. that's not easy to do. I, I have a serious jealousy about that, but my, I, I just wear contact lenses. I, I look hilarious in glasses, as you can imagine. <laughs> Um, so, uh, what? How many times did you get to film him yourself? I mean, how the bulk of it, the bulk of the filming is is your stuff, along with the archival stuff. I mean, the beginning of the film, you cut together about a million pieces of performance footage. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, I, I didn't know the manager got you a lot of archival stuff and, and stuff from maybe Sardinia or Italy or yeah, other places. Yeah. So, uh, your your own filming, how much of that was was your filming? I mean, the short answer is I don't remember. Um, the longer answer is I sat with him for four long interviews, um, and those were in uh, South Orange, New Jersey, as I, as I mentioned previously, and one was in Cambridge, Massachusetts, another was in Hudson, New York, and, uh, gosh, the other one was in New York City. Uh -huh. Yeah, so, so at, at his hotel in New York when he was playing at the Blue Note. So. So there were four long interview sessions where it was like just him, lights, cameras, and we had a couple, we had an hour or two, you know, we had some time where he, he, he had some downtime. Um, I think I have footage of him falling asleep on me twice. <laughs> so, so, and this is not to say that he was not engaged. This is to say that he was exhausted. And right. like there were, especially in, in Cambridge, I just, I just talked to him until he like was just done. Like he couldn't, you know, I was just like... You know, if you think I'm being verbose, like imagine, <laughs> imagine like Omar being verbose too, and I'm just like trying to ask like short questions. Um, so 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 it worked. I mean, we we did pretty well together. I mean, maybe that's why we gel because we talk really fast and whatever. Um, but uh, and he can do it in two languages. But but so then there were also concert. Um, uh, shoots that we did where I didn't interview him, where I just filmed him at, at Helsinki in Hudson, New York, which I really, I really recommend if ever, anybody's right. ever and been at, to Hudson. And I love Note. it there. And, What's the Blue Note. and at the Blue and Note. the Blue Note as well. Yeah, and, and we and we shot at the Blue Note. We even filmed interviews at the Blue Note with Ned Sublet and Jeff Levinson when Omar wasn't even in the country. Like we, we they, they, Jeff just let us use the Blue Note, like like it was a studio like I just called Jeff Levinson and he was like yeah well, you can go in there when they're loading in and I was like okay cool so and so those two interviews um, during the across the divide segment they were actually the exact same set we just changed the color of the lights and turned the camera a couple degrees and you got it made it look kind of like okay there's another room another time or whatever but it was just blue note um, so yeah so so there were there were there were a lot of it a lot of it's mine but a lot of it is archival and like the the last uh the last thing that you see with um with Gustavo and Yelian um the violinist uh, mm -hmm. uh that is that is completely given to us by Jazz uh Jazz Avian. um that was that was like you know somebody just did that and we was like can we use it and they said yes you know it was like you know there's a lot of um there 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 are there's less at this level there's less kind of like legalistic kind of, you know, this is my copyright and this kind of thing. Like there's a lot of like, oh yeah, this is, we just did this for promotional thing. You let us film and so you can use it for whatever you want kind of thing. So I just got lucky with a lot of the archival stuff where it's like nobody, nobody's put up a huge fight right. um, thus far. So we'll see when we try to get it released. Well, you're modest by saying that you're lucky because I think the, the whole spirit of the movie is about collaboration and uh, his spirit and letting you film and you're everything that you put together, it's all about collaboration and community. And, and what he said in the beginning about lighting the candle, he says, this is because I want them to know that I'm receiving. Mm. And he's certainly a person that's receiving at, at all, every level. We don't have much time left, but I'd love to have some questions from the audience. He is so 
unlike me, so prolific that he's constantly working. I mean, he's he is every day on his social media. It, somebody will will every week. It's like a new. Uh, co collaboration with somebody from a different place, from a different continent, from a different country, somebody he's never worked with before, somebody that he's working for, with uh, for the second time that you didn't know that he made a record with 20 years ago. You know, so there, there's so much going on. I, I don't, I don't know what his, uh, you know, status is with the with the religion. I just know that that's part of his his ritual. You know, you know when he when he works. I mean, you know. He handled it really well. Thanks. I, I, you know, again. It, I, as a, given my personhood, like white guy from Central Connecticut, not going to educate everybody about um, Santeria or El Egua because I have no knowledge other than Omar. I don't have any entry point into it other than Omar and Ned and the, and the interviews that I that I, I had. I wasn't going to be like, look at me, mystical guy, you know. Like I was, uh, no, I, I just I don't I can't do that. Well, you could have fooled us all. Um, <laughs> so one more question. One more question. All right. Well, thank you so much. What a fabulous film. What a fabulous. Thanks, everybody.